Welcome to part three of my Renting in Montreal series. This series is dry and more of the uh, info than the attainment side of infotainment. For new subscribers, these videos are a bit of a public service thing for new people in town. Look, we want to help new people move to town so we can kick Toronto's economy in the dick, right? Economic capital. So if you're bored, it's quite possible I'll see you in the next video. Although leave the uh, video playing because it helps for my stats. Right, let's get into it. So let's come to this, the end of your renting saga. Maybe you bought a house. Maybe you're moving in with your partner. Maybe you split up and you're moving out because COVID-19 exposed the laughable charade of a relationship that you'd pretended was acceptable for years but were finally confronted with. Or maybe you're making the terrible mistake of leaving Montreal. There's actually a few things you should know when you arrive at this point. And despite how hard it is to find a place at the moment and manage a relationship with a landlord, this is actually the part where I've seen the most people get it quantifiably wrong. First of all, what if your landlord has expressed a desire to repossess the dwelling from you? Well, they need a reason. They can't just kick out a tenant without cause. Montreal is in your parents' basement. Quebec has a principle called droit en maintien dans les lieux. However, as with everything, there are a few exceptions. The first category are personal in nature. A very common one occurs on the initial purchase of the property. A landlord can repossess, evict a tenant from a unit that they themselves want to move into. So a landlord buys a multiplex of three units and before I got into the co-op movement I was looking around at multiplexes myself and often the realtor will tell you when you go to a property to buy who is the worst tenant and who is paying the lowest lease so that you can strategically evict them when you move in in a couple of months if you buy the place. So they're basically like, there's a crackhead in that unit and worse still, he's only paying $300 a month. Now they can't do that if they have another vacant unit in the same building that's considered an equivalent or in the area for that matter. They have to give you a reasonable amount of notice and uh, time to respond, etc. But there isn't much you can do about this one. Another personal angle is the dependent angle. So a landlord can claim that a tenant needs to move for a relative who they have a main source of support for. So like, <laughs> grandma keeps falling down her stairs and we need her to fall down the stairs closer to her family. Or I have a man-child son who I want to move from my basement but still enable an unhealthy lifestyle for. For this one you can call bullshit and protest a virigi. I haven't heard of this happening, but theoretically you could get the eviction thrown out if you proved that it was just a ploy to get you out of the house. There never was a grandma. She's been dead for 20 years. Have trust in me. You're not Nana. Nana's dead. They just want to get rid of me because I'm a crackhead and I only pay $350 in rent. It's on you to do this though and if you lose you will get three months of rent but still have to go. There's kind of a variable timeline for all this that is spelt out really well on the uh, Reggie's website. If this is happening to you read the article from start to finish and you'll be pretty well informed on how this all works. They did a great job explaining this one. There are a few no-go's where even a good reason won't work. The first is uh, senior citizens at age 70. Basically they can't kick out a grandma to move into a house that they just bought. A smart landlord may instead try to figure out how to get the senior moved into even cheaper government provided accommodation like an old folks home or a social housing. Of course this shows the unintended effects of this policy. Landlords don't want to rent to people over the age of 60, which would normally be considered a safe and easy demographic to lease to almost anywhere else. A landlord can't evict someone if they have lived there for more than 10 years or if they qualify for low income housing. It's right, they don't even need to actually have applied for the program. Anyone who spends more than 25% of their incomes on rent is automatically protected. But they can override these no-go's with the ultimate heavyweight of Quebec tenants, the apex level tenant. Ladies and gentlemen, the senior citizen who is a landlord. Oh, no, no. A landlord grandma or grandma related to a landlord will trump any other grandma, long-term resident or even low-income family. Senior citizens and landlord circles are generally considered like the queen in a game of chess. I mean, I bet there are a few bastardy landlords out there um, with these kind of strategic eviction grandmas that they move around. It may sound like I'm shitting on landlords, but they're actually just playing their role. We have a system where there's lots of holes and they find the holes and take advantage of them because they're people. 
I'm not a big fan of rent control to solve expensive housing as a problem, not because I don't agree with the principles. I mean, I'm starting a housing co-op because I hate how housing has become an expensive investment and isn't just treated like something that everyone should have a right to. I don't like rent control because it doesn't seem to work. And watching how easily landlords find a hundred different routes around every new barrier shows exactly why it isn't a good solution. The solution? is to build more houses for people. People just work so hard to not talk about supply and demand. I mean, you might hate economics, but if you want to give the field one thing that's true, it's supply and demand. If a vacancy rate was 8%, like it was in the early 1990s, rather than the 1% that it is today, then tenants get to be in charge. It wasn't cheap back then because of rent control, just like it's not expensive today because of rent control. Same rent control, totally different prices. It was cheap because landlords were desperate for tenants. Please live here. I'll take $50 off the price. I'll match his price and drop it $20 more. But today tenants are desperate for housing. Landlords have all the power. I really need to keep saying this because people always have some pet issue like foreign buyers and vacant condos or Airbnb when all of those problems would be solved by building more housing too. Because you could house the tourists and make money off them, go into your restaurants and all that stuff, grow the economy, kick Toronto in the dick and still house all of your residents. It's fucking insane how much work we put into creating all these systems and getting annoyed at all these people rather than just building enough fucking places for people to live. Anyway, back to the less ranty part of the video. I covered all these scenarios in the second video, so check that out. Nope, it's usually up there. It's up there at the moment, but YouTube changes everything all the time, so wherever the icon is, click on that if you haven't seen it. Essentially, the screwover path, um, like not paying rent is a quick and easy uh, eviction that's prioritized um, at Virigi. The rest, like making a racket or smoking inside when it was uh, specifically banned on the lease, usually takes a couple of years. I did read one case though where this old lady was like threatening other tenants, uh, smacking the wall with a cane and smoking inside and shit. And in that case, the landlord and the other tenants worked together to help get her removed. So it is possible, but I get the sense that it's kind of hard. The most common way a landlord approaches uh, an eviction is through a buyout. Usually they'll say, hey, I'll pay for your moving expenses and uh, six months of your rent. Then you'll find out when you start looking around just how much more expensive everything has gotten since you last moved. And that is the real reason why they had tried to buy you out. Your rent was just too cheap. It was too much of a difference between your rent and what it's actually worth on the market. I've created a spreadsheet for the Montreal market to calculate what your lease is worth and put it up on Patreon. If you give me a dollar a video, not only are you going to help me to continue to do this stuff, but I might save you like literally thousands of dollars. Because everyone, everyone is undervaluing their leases so much. It's absolutely crazy. People trade $50,000 leases for $2,000 every day here. That lease being worth more every year is why all of us renters have that feeling of insecurity weighing over us like a, like a mining town or something, you know? One day our time's gonna run out, like it's good now. But, mm. There's just so much money on the table that even the nicest landlord will eventually be like, okay, uh, sorry, but I can't miss out on $100,000. I mean, would you, are you the most awesome be human being who ever lived giving 50, 100, $150,000 of value to a stranger? It doesn't have to be like evil money. Uh, money just means less whatever you don't want to do, you know, and more what you do want to do. So now you know how valuable your lease is, maybe you still want to end it for some reason. It's quite possible you just have no choice and need to walk away. Maybe you got a job at NASA and you're like, <laughs> fuck this apartment, I'm going to space. Oh shit, it's actually just Florida. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, you can't just give a three month notice and walk away. It's a contract, idiot. The reason people think that three months notice isn't a problem is because most landlords are happy to hear that you're leaving anyway. It's an opportunity to renovate, bump up the rental income, put it on Airbnb and just generally make more money. The actual formal mechanism for abandoning your lease, although uh, it's purpose has changed over the years uh, is a lease transfer. In order to do a lease transfer you must notify your landlord that you uh, will be doing it and you are responsible for finding a suitable replacement. Your landlord must sign off on the replacement which is fair I mean you can't just move in that crack yet again but uh, they need good grounds to reject them. They can't just reject them because they'd prefer to rent the place out to at a higher price or 
you know, <laughs> name your discrimination. New Zealanders. <laughs> However, leases in Montreal are a valuable commodity and I don't think that people should transfer them uh, like they have no value. You have now, through doing nothing useful other than living where you live, gotten value. It's kind of like your V1 extracting rent actually. Rent is an economic term, but um, actually I have a friend who did a video on uh, rentier estates. I will link that, um, he's a good dude. Anyway, so knowing that you're holding a document worth $20,000, you should treat it as such. You have to Blagojevich that shit and see what you can get for it, you know? It's golden. Don't just give it up for nothing. I mean, I, I've got this thing and it's fucking golden. And I, I'm just not giving it up for fucking nothing. If you just want to move around Quebec, there are uh, Facebook groups that allow you to find people who have leases and are looking for changes as well. Bachelor pad, looking for discreet place on the plateau. Measurements, three and a half <laughs> with hot tub. Basically, you can find something that you want to swap for. Like maybe you got a kid on the way, uh, well, maybe you look around for someone that wants to downsize and you take each other's leases. I covered this a little bit in the first video, um, at least when you're on the I would like a place side of things. You could also just let your friends know, I am selling my lease, and if they get the lease, uh, go through the landlord hurdle, uh, then they would pay you. Few seem to do this, but if you have, good for you, you live in reality. So that brings me to the end of this renting series, which has kind of spanned the life of this channel. I hope it's been handy for you and given you a good understanding of the issues, as well as a little uh, bit of an understanding of where the system works well and where it kind of lets us down. Let me know what other topics you'd like me to cover for a Montreal Fundamentals video. I don't really do them a lot, but I do like making stuff to help people uh, move to town because you know, I was once in that boat as well. Montreal is a wonderful place to live, but uh, deeply strange and could do with some extra explaining at times. Ready for some classic tending to type. Measurements, three and a half with hot tub. All right, I'm gonna be so embarrassed about that joke. Go to edit, but I'll keep it in because it's weird.